Good evening. I was going to say good afternoon, but it's so overcast that it feels like evening. Um, very glad to be introducing Dr. Elise Lockwood. Uh, she's assistant professor at Oregon State University in the Department of Mathematics. Her degrees are a BS and MSD in Mathematics, followed by a PhD in Mathematics Education from Portland State University in 2011, and followed by a two-year postdoctoral fellowship in Madison, where she worked with professors Eric Knuth and Amy Ellis. And if I may shamelessly just quote her website, so succinct and better than anything I could do, Lockwood's primary research interest involves undergraduate mathematics education, particularly studying how students think about and learn combinatorial topics. She has put forth a model of students' combinatorial thinking that especially emphasizes the role of sets of outcomes in effective counting. Other research in this area includes exploring student-generated connections among counting problems through a lens of actor-oriented transfer and determining the effectiveness of systematic listing in counting. Two additional collaborations in areas of research include studying the role of examples in proof and considering the relationship between mathematical content mathematical practices at all levels." End quote. Dr. Lockwood has an impressive list of publications in prominent journals of mathematics education research, such as JRME, JMB, ESM, and FLM, that means anything to anyone. Uh, she is recipient of uh, recognitions for her papers at Room, that's the uh, SIG MAA on the research in undergraduate mathematics education. She's a co-principal investigator on a grant from NSF's program on uh, research on education and learning, and was recently awarded an NSF career grant to study students' combinatorial thinking in computational settings. Today, Elisa's uh, talk will be about investigating undergraduate students generalizing activity to contrasting cases from a combinatorial context. Please join me in welcoming Elise to the Thank all right, thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate uh, the invitation to the door. Um, I also want to acknowledge, so I will say more about this NSF grant, that this is work funded by the NSF. And also this is work with one of my graduate students, Zach Reed, who has uh, worked a lot on this project. So a way of introduction, um, generalization is one of the most fundamental mathematical activities in which we engage. And there's been a considerable, considerable amount of research um, over the past decades about uh, the nature of generalizing. Uh, much of this work has been uh, on younger students, particularly in algebraic contexts, um, patterning tasks. Um, but given the importance of generalization in mathematical thinking, we, my colleagues and I, see a need to explore generalization in other types of contexts and among other levels of students. And so to this end, we have this three-year NSF project that's looking at generalization across multiple mathematical areas. So we call this the Gamma Project. Um, and essentially what we've done is we've looked both across uh, grade levels, so both with some six, grade 6 to 12 students and undergraduate students, and then also across both continuous and discrete domains. Um, and so there are four PIs, Amy Ellis and Kevin Moore at UGA, Eric Tillema is in Indiana, and then my quadrant here uh, fits right in discrete math and undergraduate students because that's what I tend to study. So it's nice we can kind of draw on our respective areas of expertise. And really our goal is to under, better understand the nature of generalization um, by looking more broadly than, than just with young kids in algebra. And so given my, my interest in uh, discrete and combinatorics, um, I'm focusing here um, in this part of the project. So why counting and combinatorics? Well, counting problems are accessible and can offer opportunities for rich mathematical thinking. Um, and I personally fell in love with counting when I was a master's student. Um, and I was fascinated by the fact that counting problems are easy to state, but they can be surprisingly difficult to solve. Maybe you've experienced this with combinatorics problems. Um, and I'm not the only one who has observed this difficulty in counting. Uh, combinatorics textbooks say that counting is hard. So George Martin wrote a book not George R. R. Martin, the Game of Thrones author, but George E. Martin wrote a book called The Art of Enumerative Combinatorics. And his first chapter is literally entitled Counting is Hard. He points out that there are a few formulas and each problem seems to be different. And in his book Applied Combinatorics, Alan Tucker says in his counting chapter, we discuss counting problems for which no specific theory exists. It is the most challenging and most valuable chapter in this book. So these are the authors of 
undergraduate and graduate level combinatorics books, and they're acknowledging this inherent difficulty with solving counting problems. And they're also highlighting, I think, an interesting feature of counting, which makes it difficult but also fun, which is that you know, there, there aren't just these prescribed processes for how you can solve any given problem, right? That they can seem to feel different and that that can be challenging. Um, math and research also indicates that counting is hard. Just as one example, Eisenberg and Zaslavsky's findings uh, support the assertion that combinatorics is a complex topic. Only 43 of 108 initial solutions were correct. So this is one of, of many resources I could, or references I could give you where we have relatively low success rates on counting problems, right? It's something that students struggle with. Um, and Anna and Lai have a nice quote. They say, math teachers are often asked, what is the most difficult topic for you to teach? Our answer is teaching students to count. Okay, so for a, a, a researcher, a method researcher, this is a nice problem to have. It's like this is difficult, and so there's something there to investigate. And in particular, I've spent the last several years trying to learn everything I can about how to improve the teaching and learning of combinatorics. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and in this particular, I'm, you know, this talk I'm sharing is one part of my work that happens to be on this generalization, but it's part of this bigger goal that I have to better understand students' counting. Um, but the Gamma Grant has been nice for me because it, it lets me focus on you know, a practice like generalization that people might more broadly care about, but then also look at combinatorial thinking, which I care about. All right, so what I want to do now is to talk through the, this passwords task. This is a particular mathematical activity that um, I gave to the students in this study. And I want to talk through it for a couple of reasons. One is, is to give a sense of of what I mean by counting and how this works, um, and also just to give some context for the data that we're going to see later on in the talk, um, and also just to, to show you the, the way in which we might build up uh, and, and generalize using this task. So the activity uses the context of passwords to facilitate a general statement of the binomial theorem. And if you don't remember what binomial theorem means, um, essentially you can you know, multiply out and expand out a little binomial like x plus y. And the idea is that as you do this, increasingly, the coefficients behave in a predictable way. Namely, they become, these are actually called binomial coefficients. Um, if the, these look familiar, these are actually the rows of the Pastel's triangle, which is not a coincidence. There's combinatorial meaning here. Um, and this is not what we emphasize with the students, but I just want to point out that this is eventually where this task can lead. And, Combinatorially, this activity is nice because it emphasizes counting the same sets of outcomes in two different ways, which is kind of the, the basis of combinatorial proof. Um, and more importantly, this activity provides opportunities for students to generalize. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about how this fits in in terms of our methods, but you know, I want to study students' generalization, and so I want to see how students actually engage in generalizing activity. So let's spend a little time talking through this password test. So we start by asking students how many passwords consists of just uppercase letters A and B. So how many passwords are there of length of three that consist of uppercase A's and or B's? So you can imagine a little length three password, right? And for each position, no matter what I have for a given position, I have two options, right? Always A or B. And by the multiplication principle, uh, we get that there are two cubed passwords, right? The stages of the process are independent and we can multiply. So there are two cube total AB passwords of length three. Now, we also ask the students to count this problem in a different way, this time organizing the passwords according to the number of A's in the password. Right, and so if you think about all eight of these passwords, some of them are gonna have no A's, some of them are gonna have one A, et cetera. And so what you might do is actually just list these out and then use that list to fill out the table of passwords. Right? And so there are, this is another way to structure those eight passwords that we get. Then we kind of extend and go to a length four password. And there are two to the fourth such passwords for the same reason. And again, here, we could just list them out and, and fill this out. And, and it, it makes sense. You, you don't have to make this kind of combinatorial argument, but you could, that I can think about there being four passwords with exactly one A because I'm just, choosing which of the position I put the A in, and then everything else has to be a B, right? So you can start to recognize these binomial coefficients, but even if you don't know that term, you can still use some systematic listing to fill out these tables. Um, finally, 
we would also ask two to the, uh, for a five character password and we get one, five, ten, ten, five, one, and here's how they are structured. Okay, so that's the AB password tasks. Now we are gonna start to generalize and build up and we have AB one password tasks. So how many passwords of length three are there that consist of uppercase A's, B's, and or the number one? And I'll say more about this later, but the reason I have a 1 and not a C is because I want to distinguish between two types of characters and letters and numbers. So again, if we have a three character AB1 password, same kind of reasoning, I have three options for each of the three positions, so I get three Q. And then we similarly make a table, but now we're organizing according to the number of ones in the password. So let's talk about how we might, we could certainly list, but let's talk about how we might fill this out. So if I'm thinking about how many, again, three character passwords consisting of A, B, and one, how many have no ones in them? Well, there's only one way to have no ones in my password. And then if I have no ones, the remaining three positions all can be either A or B. And so there are two cubed such passwords, right? If I have exactly one one in the password, I have one, two, three places where that one can be. And then for any placement of the one, I have now two options for what the other positions can be. So I get two squared. With exactly two ones, I have, again, one, two, three ways I can arrange the ones. And then for any placement of those ones, I have two options, A or B. And then finally, there's just one all ones password. Right? Does that make sense? And just notice, and, and we'll explore this a little bit more, but it, it's not a coincidence that these binomial coefficients are showing up again. These are the, the ways that I can place the ones in this password. If we ask for four characters, again, we get a, a three to the fourth because we have three options for each of four positions. And we could make a similar argument and fill out our table like this. And then same for, for five. And so the point is, and, and something that I'll, I'll show in the data, is that you know, there's an opportunity to look at the AB1 passwords and to reflect back on the AB passwords that you filled out. Like they're related to each other. OK. And just to make a comment about ultimately where this can go, um, let's consider a problem like this. How many passwords of length 5 are there that consist of A's, B's, C's, 1's, and or 2's? So again, because we've got five choices of character for five, char five positions, we have five to the fifth. But let's just, for example, talk through this if we have three numbers. Now we're making a table where we're organizing it according to the number of numbers in the, in the uh, password. And so if I have three numbers, first I want to consider how many ways could I have three numbers in this five character password. You might see it as five choose three, which is 10, or you could count, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, right? Ways to have three numbers in the password. For any placement of three numbers, I have two options for what the numbers can be, one or two, and I have three options for what the letters can be, A, B, or C. Oops. So then these, this is a way you can fill out the table, um, and then once we do that, you could eventually ask, instead of just a particular number of numbers and letters, you can build up to generally X numbers and Y letters. And so this can yield the binomial theorem, like I said, right? Um, we didn't actually have students, uh, we had one student get all the way here who had some background um, in counting, but the point is that you can still engage in some kind of reasoning about these tables and combinatorially what's happening just by uh, maybe doing some listing and, and some thinking like that. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about the, the methods and the theoretical perspectives that I'm bringing on this, to this task. So as I mentioned, this is part of this uh, project that's looking um, across multiple mathematical areas. And so we were, each PI was doing interviews, but I was doing um, interviews just with, with undergraduate coming to work students. So I gave 10 students these passwords activity on um, individual videotaped interviews. Um, and just to give you a sense of the project, this is from the first year. And so we're just trying to kind of explore students, what, how students are going to generalize in their activity. 
And then in the second year, we're doing teaching experiments, and in the third year, design experiments to try to actually facilitate some productive general, generalizing for students. Uh, but in this first year, just trying to help students, or just trying to see what types of generalizing activities students are naturally doing. So um, I interviewed nine calculus students and one more advanced student who had taken some discrete math. Um, the two students I'm going to talk about today were both calc students, and they tend to be nice students for me to use, or to use, to study because they are novice counters. They haven't taken counting in college, and yet they're kind of motivated math students um, who have some mathematical maturity often. So we asked them to think aloud. We asked them some clarifying questions. So there was some uh, interaction during these interviews. Um, we transcribed them. We made these enhanced transcripts with uh, you know, images and, and gestures recorded. And then essentially for this particular talk, I'm going to discuss this phenomenon that we observed among two students that sort of externally looked to be the same, but that actually, when we looked a little deeper, the, the students were doing different things. And so we really just tried to examine these uh, episodes and try to figure out what was going on and, and make some explanatory, uh, yeah, explain the differences between what we, what we observed in these two students. So just a couple comments about theoretical perspective. So how am I taking generalization? Am I following Amy Ellis, who just this talks about generalizing as being as engaging in at least one of these activities, identifying commonality across cases, extending one's reasoning beyond the range in which it originated, or deriving broader results about new relationships from particular cases. So this is what we mean by generalization. Um, and she also developed this generalization taxonomy, where she describes three main generalizing actions, searching, relating, and extending. Um, and in this talk, I want to focus on relating. So students engage in relating by creating a relation or making a connection between two or more situations, problems, ideas, or objects. And I'm going to argue that I think we identified a couple of instances of relating that were particularly powerful for this one student. Um, we're also starting to think about generalization as framed by Piaget's notions of reflective of abstraction, and in particular, reflective abstraction. So Piaget fundamentally distinguishes between empirical abstraction and reflective abstraction. And there's a quote by von Glasserstel that's helpful for me in making sense of these. He says, the mental operation of abstraction is empirical when abstraction is made from sensory motor material, reflective when it concerns the subject's own activity. So there's a, a fundamental distinction between abstraction that is based on, on your own activity or mental operations when you're reflecting there versus abstraction that you're making when it's maybe just external to you. Piaget then goes on to uh, kind of subcategorize reflective abstraction, and again, this is according to von Glasserfeld's interpretation, um, where reflecting abstraction I, I think of as just kind of like the normal kind of reflective abstraction. So reflecting abstraction projects and reorganizes on another conceptual level a coordination of pattern of the subject's own activities or operations, as I described. And then pseudo-empirical abstraction is kind of that, but also with the addition that it relies on some suitable sensory motor material. So there's, there's some sensory motor um, like interaction or activity that's happening that, that helps with this reflected abstraction. And then reflected is also similar to reflecting, but it includes the subject's awareness of what has been abstracted. And sometimes reflected abstraction is talked about as a retroactive thematization. So anyway, we've been using this as a way to perhaps distinguish between qualitative differences between generalizing activity that we're observing in students. And I especially today want to argue that, that hopefully I can provide some instances where reflective abstraction is a useful uh, kind of explanatory mechanism for differences that we see in these students. So uh, broadly, you know, here are Ellis's generalizing actions, here are uh, PJ's types of abstraction, and so I'm hoping today that I'm going to provide some examples of relating that are instances of reflective abstraction. And just as a side note, you know, in this Gamma project, one thing that we're doing is to try to give a little bit more of a, a theoretical underpinning of, you know, of Ellis's maybe initial frame of, of generalization, right? So she's describing generalizing actions, but can we try to get at some of the mechanisms cognitive mechanisms that underlie generalization. Um, so we're working toward that. We're just not quite 
done with our framework enough for me to like cite it in this talk, but that's where we're heading. Um, I want to briefly mention how I'm thinking about combinatorial thinking. Um, and basically, I adopt like a set-oriented perspective, um, which is a way of thinking about counting that views attending to sets of outcomes as an intrinsic component of solving counting problems. Um, and this may seem obvious if you think about counting, that of course it's about enumerating the number of outcomes, but often students can view counting not really in that way. Like they may view counting just as, you know, identifying a problem type or looking for a key word or memorizing some formula, right? But counting fundamentally is about how are you structuring and thinking about these sets of outcomes. Um, and also, a colleague and I have a study where we found that listing outcomes even partially was positively correlated with undergraduate students solving counting problems correctly. And so the point here is just that I view listing and systematically listing outcomes as like an inherently valuable activity in which students can, can and should engage when they count. Okay. And then finally, uh, meanings. So Thompson talks about meanings. Um, and essentially, I think of this as like an extension of Harrell's when he talks about a way of thinking. So a meaning is like the, the way of thinking about a particular concept or idea. It's how you approach or think about a mathematical idea. Um, and Thompson talks about meaning as being from the student's perspective, not an expert's perspective. And so we can study like the meanings that students make of, of mathematics, in particular mathematical ideas. So in this talk in particular, I want to characterize students' meanings of these tables that they're going to create about the passwords. And then a meanings of a generalized representation <coughs> that the students spontaneously developed. Okay, so with all that, with some theor theoretical perspectives, I can now state my research questions. So what I'm going to try to address today is what meanings do students make of what externally appears to be the same spontaneously generated representation, and what do these meanings suggest about students' generalization in combinatorial contexts? All right. So, let's get to the results. Uh, basically, I'm going to present two contrasting cases. Um, I have two students, Tyler and Richie. Uh, these are pseudonyms, both students were male. Um, Tyler was a vector calc student, um, and Richie was an integral calc student. So, both novice counters, um, but have some mathematical experience. And what we're going to see is that the two students had I'm going to argue, had two different meanings for what externally appeared to be the same generalized representation. And one of the students, Tyler, was able to use and leverage this representation pretty powerfully in subsequent tasks, um, and Richie was not. And so I want to answer this question, what enabled Tyler to leverage this generalized representation, and what prevented Richie from doing so, and what does this tell us about generalization? Alrighty, so what I'm going to do is start by describing Tyler's work and kind of briefly and then describe Ricky's work and then draw some comparisons and then provide some sort of ex explanation for what I think is going on. So the first thing to note is that Tyler's initial activity um, involves systematically listing outcomes, which as I mentioned is something that I, I think is good and, and useful. So for example, on this very first three character AB password task that we gave him, notice that he's, he, he listed them completely and then also there's some, somewhat systematically here it appears. There's at least a structure to it. And he, he first listed and then he uses that to fill out this table of this 1331, right? So there's a connection for him between what the numbers in this table are, namely the, the passwords that he's just listed. We move on to the four character AB password task, and again, we see that he lists and uses those lists to fill out the table, and he's being systematic. So he's describing, I started with the first one being A, I did like two A's, then B's, moved the B over one, moved the B, next, the next B over one. And so he's, he's, he's not just kind of randomly or willy-nilly writing down outcomes, he's trying to be systematic. And he also demonstrated um, quite a bit of self-regulation. So he like ask himself, do I have them all? Should I check, right? So he's, he's engaging in the kind of initial activity we would like to see in a, not in a student who's trying to solve a counting problem. Also of note is that Tyler figured out that there were two to the n total n length passwords. So we had given him, you know, three character AB passwords, 
four character, five character, and he starts to observe this, this pattern, and he says, oh, there seems to be a correlation. I ask, what's the correlation? He says, eight, 16, and 32. They double, I guess, if you add one, so I'm guessing for six, it'd be 64. So we see him engaging, in, even in some extending here, where he's saying, if you asked me the next table, I think there would be 64 total passwords. And we asked him how many there would be for an n character password, and he gets, correctly gets there two to the n, two to the n, right? Now, this is noteworthy. Um, I actually, we didn't get to talk about this very much with him. I don't think he had a very good combinatorial justification for why they were two to the end combos. So there are ways that you can justify that. I think for Tyler, he really was just observing this numerical pattern, and he had the algebraic skills to come up with this two to the end combinations. But for now, that's neither here nor there, because I think the value is that he could, he had some closed form expression and understanding that there was some total number of AD passwords. Okay. So then we, we, we're finished working with AD passwords, so we move on to the AD1 case, right? So we ask about three character AD1 passwords, and he engages in similar kind of activity. Um, he knows that for a, when there are three ones, like an all ones password, there's just going to be one. And then he, he lists out, and these lists represent what's written here. So again, we see him engaging in some kind of careful, self-regulated, systematic listing of outcomes to get these answers, right? So I'm going to show you a clip right now. And he's just, he hasn't written this yet. So pretend that there's nothing written here. I couldn't find a nice image of it. Um, but he's just finished doing some listing. And I'm, we're, we're working now on how many three-character AB1 passwords have zero ones in them, right? That's what he's going to work on, OK? So three character 81 passwords with zero ones. OK, so can you see how it's kind of tilted on its side? And that's what he's reasoning about. So hopefully this is loud enough. Great. And then how about for zero? Zero. Uh, it's not going to be ones. OK. what he had written on the page there, but notice, first of all, notice he started listing, right? So he wrote out AAA, and then he kind of pauses, and he's like, wait, I've actually already literally listed these eight passwords. And so he re reflects back on that prior activity of listing, and points back to this three character AB table, and says, yeah, it's just eight, that's the same thing. Okay, so kind of nice. So now we move on to the four character AB1 task. So he finished that table, and again, he's he knows that there are, there's one, so four character AB1 with number of ones. So a four character AB1 password that has four ones, there's just one of them, right? That's the all one password. Using some similar reasoning that we just saw, he knows that for zero ones, it's going to be 16 total passwords. And so we're, we're going to watch another video, and he's working on the one one. So again, four character password that can be AB1 with 1-1. One, one. And it should get 32 because there are four positions, basically, for where that 1-1 one, one could go. And then everything else is going to be just A or B, right? There's two options for it. Does that make sense? OK, so watch what he, he does here. So this is what the situation that we're in. And he's going to introduce this nice generalized outcome that is pretty cool. Three spots with 
two different letters, mm -hmm. there's going to be eight different ways to do it. Okay. Um, so I guess eight, eight, there's eight different of each of those. Okay. You're thinking of that as kind of that four times eight? Yes, I am. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so notice what Tyler does here. I don't know if you can hear my voice. I was very excited when he wrote the ones in the nexus, right? That's, that's pretty cool. Um, so he spontaneously introduced this more general outcome of ones and x's, right? And he essentially is using placeholders for what the a and b could be. And furthermore, he explicitly relates back. I mean, he's pointing to this 1331. That's the eight table for AB passwords. And relates back to, to how that fits in with the X's, right? OK. So to sum up, oh, sorry, no, not yet. He, sorry, for the, we continue working on the four character AB password task. And again, for now, exactly two ones, he writes the ones and X's again. And he says, Okay, is that all of them? So again, being self-regulatory, he says, yeah, six. That would make sense. And I say, well, does that make sense? And he says, well, that's two variables. Like, instead of doing three things, there's two. And I'm interpreting that as, instead of having ones, A's, and B's, I just have two characters, ones and X's. And he says, with the four combo, so two was six over here. That's why I thought it made sense. So this is the AB password with exactly two A's, right? And there are six such passwords, right? So he, he's in this AB1 password case, but he reflects back to the AB password case where he just had two arrangements of, uh, sorry, arrangements of two A's and two B's. And he says, oh, there were six arrangements of two A's and two B's, six arrangements of two ones and two X's. That's why I think that makes sense. Just as one, Final bit of evidence for how he's thinking. So again, he had gotten for AB the AB uh, five character case. He had gotten one five ten ten five one, and we gave him a bit of an extension task now with a five letter password. And he says, I will use the one five ten ten five one. He says these are all the number of, number of combinations you can do with two things that are changing. So there's something, and I'll say more about this that he recognizes where. All that matters really is that there are two different characters that are changing. Maybe it doesn't matter if they're X's and ones or A's and B's. Okay, now to summarize his activity. Um, his initial activity was this systematic listing, which was really nice. Um, and if we think about his meaning of the AB tables, so he understood the rows of the tables as giving the number of ways to arrange two characters. And he could articulate an expression for the totals of the tables, which is and in terms of his meaning of the 11XX, one, one and I've used this just to mean um, whatever he wrote, the 11XX one, one kind of structure, he spontaneously and regularly related the 11XX one, one to his prior work. He could think of AABB and 11XX one, one as fundamentally similar structures or outcomes. And he also could think of the Xs in the 11XX one, one as reducing to a previous problem involving A's and B's. Right, so that's my summary of Tyler's work that I just described. So now let's look at Richie. So Richie had um, some, some different ways of, I mean, some similarities, but a different initial activity. So for one thing, he did a little bit of listing, but he was much less systematic and much less self-regulated. So for instance, you know, he listed a couple, but he gets 1221 instead of 1331. And it's not until we kind of ask him to think more carefully and to list more carefully that he changes it to 1331. Similarly, on the four character AB password task, he does a little listing, but it's not super systematic and not careful. So he gets this, and it's not until we draw his attention to the fact that he missed a couple that he gets the 14641. And so he's less, and we'll see evidence for this in the next slide, but there's, whereas with Tyler, there was a clearer relationship between the outcomes and the, that that was used to actually fill out the table. Here, there's a sense that the outcomes were kind of there, but he was just trying to fit a numerical pattern in the table. 
And to see this, let's look at this five character case. So here we have a five character AB password. And so we should be getting 1510 here, right? That's the number of, that's what you would expect in this table. And what he does is he lists a few and, and then writes seven. So he doesn't actually list even all seven. He just lists some and thinks, oh, I, I bet there are seven. And I said, well, how do you get seven? And he says, well, I was thinking about like, the pattern that's showing up. And he says, in previous problems, it's just been like two more than the preceding one. So what I'm interpreting here is that he means it went 1, 3, it went 1, 4, 6, and so 1, 5, 7 means more, right? The 1, 3, the 4, 6, so 5, 7 makes sense. And he even says, I'm just assuming that this is 5 because the previous pattern is increasing by 1, 3, 4, 5. So there's a fundamentally different way that he's approaching these tables than Tyler, namely mostly looking for this kind of numerical pattern, maybe doing some listing, but ultimately viewing the, just the numerical pattern is what he's trying to do. Um, also of note is that um, even though Richie noted, noticed some regularity in the totals of the AB tables, he wasn't able to articulate um, the total. So he noticed it was going 8, maybe 16, 32, and he says, I want to say n times 8, but that doesn't make sense. So he didn't come up with 2 to the n in the same way that Tyler did. Which is not to put Richie down, but I think that that may have made it harder for him to then generalize it. Um, okay, so when we look at the three character AB1 password task, um, notice a couple things, sorry, that's hard to read. So again, think about what this table could and should look like. So if there are no ones in a three character AB1 password, there should be, you know, eight total passwords, right, with no one in it. And notice that he's attuned to the symmetry in the table. So he is generalizing something. He's carrying over the symmetry that he saw in the AB table. Um, so same kind of thing, not really using the listing to fill out the tables, but rather just trying to find some, some pattern. On the four character AB1 password task, he starts to fill it out. He correctly gets that there are 16 with no ones. And so when we get to 1-1, one, one, he gets 32, and I ask him where he gets 32, but he again is, is relying on sort of a numerical pattern. He says, well, with the character added, I was thinking we were like doubling the possibilities. So it was 16, now I think it's going to be 32. So now I'm going to show another clip, and we're going to look at his work on trying to figure out, again, four character AB1 with exactly two ones in it. Right? So you can imagine having figuring out where to put the two ones, and then the remaining spots can be either A's or B's. All right. So what we're going to see is he's going to just tally a couple because he's trying to just keep track. Um, but then watch what happens. He's going to bust out the same type of, of representation that Tyler did, which was surprising to me. Whoops, sorry. spontaneously comes up with this 11xx structure, right? Pretty cool. Um, and so what I, what he went on to do is explain how he's reasoning about the, these four, and he says, the reasoning makes sense to me, these two letters B and A can only be in four configurations, like B, E, A, 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 B, B, A, and so he argues that that's how he gets the, the times four. Now, interestingly, um, 
you know, he hadn't previously done like a two character AB problem. Um, and so it, it's hard to tell right here if he's doing any reflecting back or if he's just treating the problem kind of as new. But I'm going to argue and we'll, we'll see that he, he's not going to be able to relate this back to prior work as Tyler did. So just to, to summarize briefly this part, notice that he, he introduces this generalized representation of 1s and Xs. He uses the Xs as placeholders for what A and B could be. But he's not viewing the X's as reducing to a previous problem involving A's and B's. Okay, and, and here's evidence for that. So he does the same thing on a five character AB1 task. He writes ones and four X's. And so think about what Tyler might do in this situation. He would say, oh, well, this is a four character AB password. I've done that. There are 16 total options, right? I've already figured that problem out. Richie does times eight for each of these. And notice what happens. So he says, okay, I put X's for where the A's and B's could be, because those are variables that can be either A or B, which is great. And he says, I noticed for every X, it has two possibilities, either A or B, also great. But then he says, so there's four X's. I just multiply that by two to get eight, and that's how I got four. Right? So there's something that's happening here where he, he knows what the X's can be, he knows that it can be A's and B's, but he's not relating it back to his prior work of the A-B tables. Right? And in fact, he treats it like a new problem, but he solves it incorrectly. Right? Because it's not 2 times 4, it should be 2 times 4. A little bit more evidence for this. Again, he lists all 10 combinations of 1's and X's, of 2 1's and 3 X's, which is great. And I say, does that 10 make sense? Does it make sense why there are 10? And again, think of Tyler's rationale. He said, yeah, it's 10 because there's just 10 ways to arrange two types of characters. Right? But Richie says, I think 10 makes sense because the last one was 5. And so I'm just going to double as I go. Right? So again, looking more at this patterning than, than relating back at all to prior work on the AB tables. So to summarize Richie's work, um, his, initial, his initial activity demonstrates kind of non-systematic listing with not very much self-regulation. His meaning of the tables was that the rows of the tables represent numerical patterns to be computed, right? And he didn't, didn't articulate an expression for the totals of the tables. And his meaning of this 1-1-X-X structure, he seemed motivated by efficiency, right? But he solved problems anew instead of relating back to his prior work. And he didn't seem to think of AABB and 11XX as fundamentally similar. At least not, he didn't bring that up, right? It could be that he was thinking about that, but that's not how he seemed to be reasoning about it. And he saw the X's as placeholders for A's and B's, but not as reducing to some previous problem he had already done involving A's and B's. Okay. So if we talk now about comparing the students, uh, I mean, one point to make is that there were some similarities among the students, right? So they did do some listing, even though Tyler was more systematic and regulated than Richie was. And then the big thing is they both used, they both came up with this 11XX generalization, or generalized outcome. Um, and I think for me, particularly given that that outcome is so potentially powerful, right? Like you look at that and you think, oh, that's awesome. That's going to allow you to answer all these other problems. Um, it's interesting that Tyler leveraged it in a different way than Richie would do. So what was different in their work? Well, as I just said, Tyler was able to leverage this 11XX and subsequent problems, while Richie was not. And I'm, infer I'm inferring that Tyler's meanings of 11XX facilitated subsequent successful use of that generalized representation um, in ways that, that it didn't for Richie. And in particular, I think that Tyler engaged in two kinds of relating uh, that I'm going to talk about. So, one is creating a structurally similar outcome. And I think of this as generalizing the rows of the AB table. And one is what I'm going to call recursive embedding, generalizing the totals of the AB tables. So I think that these are two types of relating that Tyler engaged in that, that Richie did not engage in. So when I say creating a structurally similar outcome, I mean that he made an explicit connection between the six arrangements of 11XX and the six arrangements of A's, of two A's and two B's, right? 
I say, does the 14641 look familiar? He says, that's just the number of combos you can do with two, which was the same thing I did over here. And so somehow Tyler is identifying, sorry, identifying that it doesn't matter if I'm arranging A's and B's or ones and X's. The important thing is I just have two kinds of characters that I'm arranging. And again, a little more evidence. He says, yeah, these are all the number of combinations I can do with just two things that are changing. So I'm interpreting that Tyler recognized that the AB tables essentially represent the number of sequences with a given length with any two characters. It doesn't matter to him that there are ones and x's or that there's a's and b's. What matters is just that, that it's two, time, two types of characters. Um, Richie, on the other hand, was never able to explain why the number of arrangements of ones and x's made sense, right? So when he got 10 of them, he thought it was based on some numerical pattern, and he, he never connected that to the fact that there were 10 ways to arrange, say, two A's and three B's. So he wasn't viewing, let alone creating, 11XX as an outcome that was structurally similar to AABB. The other type of relating I think Tyler engaged in was what we call recursive embedding. And I mean that Tyler reflected on prior activity and, and, for lack of a better word, inserted that activity into the current situation. So in particular, he recognized the X's in the 11XX structure as representing placeholders into which he could embed this previous situation, right? Namely, his work with AB passwords. So if we think about the, you know, the ones and X's that he wrote, when he sort of paused, right, and, and, and thought back about this, it's like if I were to make a model or a representation of what I think is happening, he's actually like inserting those A's and B's in each of those cases, right? He already has that list and he's just inserting them into the X's here. And again, that's contrasted with Richie, who didn't seem to think of, say, these four X's as being related to the prior work he had done, right? He's treating it like a new problem, He's not recursively embedding that prior work into the given situation. Okay, and then just finally, if, if we agree that, that those were two types of relating that Tyler uh, engaged in that Richie did not, um, why did Tyler make these connections and, and Richie did? Why was he able to engage in relating um, like this? And I'm gonna just argue or, or put forth that the difference can be explained by this, by reflective abstraction, by Piaget's notion of reflective abstraction. Um, which again involves making abstractions from an individual's own activity um, and operations and then applying that activity into a, a new or current situation. So consider their initial activity, right? Tyler's was grounded in systematic outcome listing. He listed outcomes carefully with their structure and organization in mind. And Richie was not really engaged in, in the listing. The listing for him wasn't generative. It was all about finding patterns and numerical patterns, and the listing was just kind of in, inconsequential. And so it makes sense when we look at a, a, this example, which is kind of my favorite example, right? When he, he started the list AAA, and he pauses, and it really is like, I've already done this exact activity before, right? Like it, it triggered for him a reminder of the activity that he had done, and then he relates back, brings that forward, and, and it helps him to reason about the current situation. So I, I argue that this is an example of reflective abstraction, right? Because the listing of AAA seemed to trigger for Tyler this prior activity. He looked back at that prior listing of the eight passwords, recognized that he was in a similar situation, and then he understood that prior activity within the context of the current activity. So it's sort of like he recognizes it, he goes back, looks at the prior activity, and then uses it in the new situation. I also am going to argue or maybe kind of ask whether this is an example of pseudo-empirical abstraction. And the reason I, I think that is that the, the reflective abstraction in which he engaged seemed really connected in that clip to the physical act of listing that he did, right? So he lists one of them that that activity seems then to cause him to sort of remember that he had already done finished listing. Um, and just as a comment, I mean, in our project, we're struggling with, with suitable definitions of pseudo-empirical abstraction, because some, it seems, characterize it as just hey, everything is pseudo-empirical abstraction. Sometimes it feels like it's framed as this very unsophisticated way of reasoning, right? Like if you're not really reasoning carefully, it's just pseudo-empirical. Um, but I think 
maybe this is the case, this particular example with Tyler, of sophisticated, nice, kind of productive pseudo-empirical abstraction, right? Where he's, he's looking back, but it's triggered by the sensory motor activity of listening. Um, and also, just another case of reflective abstraction, I mean, he is explicitly, you know, relating the current situation, say, involving two ones and two x's, with the prior activity of listing that he's done. So it, it feels like he's engaging in this reflective abstraction. Um, so, in, in our opinion, Tyler's case illuminates the, the important role that reflective abstraction can play in generalization. And potentially it offers um, an example of, like what I said, of sophisticated pseudo-empirical abstraction. Also, just something that I'm wondering about, you know, given in common rhetorics how important it is to list outcomes and to think about outcomes and to reason about the structure of outcomes, maybe this lends itself to this type of pseudo-empirical abstraction. Um, so hopefully I've, I've at least, well, I've tried to make the case that, that maybe I've identified a couple of kinds of relating. This generating a structure with similar outcomes seems pretty domain-specific to common rhetorics. Maybe recursive embedding is more general. Um, but th these are relating that are, are sort of embedded, or not embedded, but uh, underpinned by this reflective abstraction, the Tyler equation. So just some concluding thoughts. So in terms of generalization, um, we feel that you know, reflecting on one's prior activity seems to be a potentially productive way to facilitate generalization. Right, and if, if we agree or, or believe that generalizing is something that students should be able to do, that this is important and useful for math students to do, um, then we do want to think about ways that we can help students generalize. And so making explicit connections to prior activity uh, might be a way to do that. Um, and I've given a couple of examples of some relating that, that seems to be useful. And so we should be thoughtful and intentional about the kinds of initial domain-specific activities in which students engage. So if we think that it's going to be useful for them to reflect back on activity, then we want to be thoughtful about the kind of activity that students initially do. Um, and in fact, if we want to engender productive generalizations, we may have students very explicitly reflect back on their prior work. So maybe, hey, can you make an explicit connection with what you did back there? And, and why is that useful? How can you use it here? Maybe have students answer metacognitive questions about their activity, right? Like, like, what are you doing? What did you do back then? Why did you do it? How is that relevant here? That might help students engage in reflective abstraction and, and generalize more productively. And then just a couple closing comments about uh, combinatorics and the combinatorial thinking. Um, I want to point out that for Tyler, you know, this is the type of work that I, we want to foster. And in particular, his association of AABB and 11XX as being structurally similar um, was instrumental in his success. And this is exactly what we want students to, to realize, right? That, that there's something uh, structurally about, say, just arranging A's and B's and 1's and X's that doesn't have to do with the fact that they're actually A's and B's or 1's and X's, right? And, and so this was an interesting case for me to see something that, that I would like to see in, in more of my students. Um, also, I think we should encourage explicit reflection about similarities with prior problems and experiences, particu particularly in terms of the structure of outcomes. All right, so how is what you're doing now similar to this other thing that you counted and, and why? And also, I think that you know, systematic listing can be a productive domain-specific initial activity on which students can then reflect, um, especially in common works in particular. Okay, so I will leave you with that, and thank you so much for your attention. Questions, questions, comments? Describe generalization as a practice, 
sort of, even if we distill out, like regardless of, of grade level and, and content level, right? And we are seeing interesting phenomena. So even though like I'm in this combinatorial context, like maybe Amy looking at middle school students sees something similar where it's like, oh, in this case, reflective abstraction like really helped this one student be more productive than this other student. And so trying to get, get language like that to, to try to talk about generalization as a practice that is, I mean, it, it can never be devoid of like content or context, but just trying to better understand the nature of, of that, if that makes sense. And I think, um, you know, at, at this point, like I mentioned, we are trying to come up with a, a framework. So it's kind of nice, I mean, Amy's initial taxonomy and framework just came out of her work with, say, middle school students. And so we've, by analyzing some of this data and looking across other areas too, we now are seeing, like, are there other types of relating that we want to talk about? Are there other types of activity that we see that weren't initially captured with her? So like the recursive embedding thing hadn't come up before. And so now it sort of gives us other, is it just specific to combinatorics? Are there other things, areas we might see it? Yeah. Um, and then, sorry, and just as one other comment, I think, like I said too, so starting is kind of this maybe descriptive, what else are we seeing about generalization, but ultimately trying to come up with maybe more prescription about how you could foster productive generalizing activity for students. And by productive, I just mean um, helping students to, to generalize in a way that, that they sort of have, is associated with understanding, right? Not just maybe patterning or something, but, but deeper, um, yeah, useful generalizations. So, yeah. so I, have, I have a question about uh, the comparison and in, in particular the question of why uh, Richie Secretary yeah. um, did not make that connection. Would you, would you say that when Tyler makes the connection, does the idea of an analogy maybe come to mind? I mean, that, I mean you have those X's and somehow before it was A's, so X's are not A's, but in some deeper structural sense they were analogous so that he, it seems like he detected what Dedrick Gentner might call like a structural alignment mm -hmm. in things that are close and mm -hmm. other ones are, yeah. because in, in so doing you have to sort of overcome things that are not alike. Yep, yep. I, yeah, the follow up question yep. for that would be then, um, when I, if I'm tutoring say a student who is at that very point and I'm kind of deliberating Mm, should I, as you spoke about, what might be productive interventions? Mm -hmm. So I uh, wonder if these things will fit. Yeah, so I mean, I think one comment, I, I agree. I think that, that, I actually think the issue was that, you know, Richie didn't even maybe ever know that looking back and comparing was even something he could or should be doing, right? So I think for Tyler, it was even just, well, the fact that he was looking back at all and relating at all was, was just fundamentally different from Richie, who never looked back. And so it might be as simple as just somehow, you know, Tyler realized, like Tyler saw the inherent connection between the activities in a way that Richie didn't, right? Like, so I think w were Richie to be presented with these comparisons, maybe he could make an analogy and say, oh yeah, actually they're the same. It was more just like, it didn't even cross his mind that he might build upon the prior case in any way. Does that make sense? And, and which is interesting, and so I think if a student is there, and that's why I think even just suggesting to Richie, like, hey, is there a way you could use that other table you made in this problem might have made him, you know, see a connection that he didn't spontaneously see, but it was more like his current activity just felt totally isolated from what he had done before. And I also think that, again, the richness of that initial activity, though, the fact that they were so different totally makes sense. I mean, Richie wasn't thinking of those tables as anything but these numerical patterns, and so why would he look back and think, oh, I listed before, I'm gonna use that here, right? So it's not like, I mean, I totally understand Richie's behavior because it, there was nothing meaningful for him to really draw upon, yeah. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I, I do think that the analogy that you mentioned with Tyler, I think, makes sense. And I just think Richie wasn't even at the point where he was comparing the two situations. Yeah. It's 
seemed like um, Richie didn't have as deep of a conceptual understanding of the first problem. Yes. Um, so do you think that might have, like, for him it seemed it was almost strictly procedural. He was just yes. Like, so I, I totally agree. And I think that's a, another way to maybe characterize what, I, yeah, how I was saying his initial activity just wasn't as rich. I think he didn't as deeply understand the problem, especially, you know, what those numbers in the table were representing in terms of the passwords. So, yeah, absolutely. But doesn't it depend almost totally on the systematicity of his work? I mean, it, it didn't just came up to him just like this. The minute he, he, he felt he was starting to do the same thing that he already did, then he was open to, to mm -hmm. see the, the connections. Mm -hmm. It didn't, didn't come up to him. Um, with, if he wouldn't have worked systematically, then maybe he would have felt another... Um, you know, yeah, and you mean the the first, yeah, yeah, the first... Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think even in... I mean, we didn't look that closely, but even when they both sort of write the ones and X's, I mean, for Richie, the second student, even that was based on sort of, he was like, I don't want to write ones, A's and B's a bunch of times. Like, so I think it, it was motivated by, even at that level, trying to streamline the work that he had already been doing, right? And so I, I think you're right, like, the, the systematicity is totally affecting their, yeah. yeah. yeah no, I'm trying to uh, generalize from what sure, you have yeah. told us, and I admit that seeing too many numbers doesn't give me, I don't feel too good with too many numbers, so, sure. so uh, you're describing a, a way to generalize which is very, I, I, I think, uh, domain specific, mm -hmm. because you build it from bottom up with the systematicity which plays a crucial role, as I understand it. Uh, and, uh, and my question is, how um, how would you refer to uh, I don't know maybe possible other possible possibilities where you where the, too many details uh, um, disturb uh, disturb you when you make uh, to make or to see uh, the principles that you can uh, then generalize and take out of it and move mm -hmm. and use it in another compass maybe in some other. Uh, domains it, it would be, or maybe it's a personal style, I don't know, where, where you, you work top down in order to, or you analyze the system top down so that you can stay at the higher level and take the principle and, and generalize from it and try to use it in another context instead of building it very systematically from, yeah, yeah. from bottom up. Well, so it's a good, it's a great point and, and good question. I mean, we, the only thing that maybe comes to mind to talk about that is, you know, we do have cases too where students might generalize. It, I think they call it like an abduction or abduce, like maybe from just one particular case, right? You sort of draw out, you're not based on this patterning, right? You just draw out some fundamental structure that you think you see. Um, and so we do, I think, see instances of, of that. Um, in some of the data that we're looking at here or in other of, of the projects. Um, and in those cases, I, I think it's there might be other mechanisms, right? That maybe the reflecting back on prior activity isn't what is allowing for some more meaningful generalization, right? Because you don't have anything to reflect back on. Um, Though Richie did have something to reflect on, it just wasn't systematic enough, so it yes, gets yeah, the right... Uh, yeah, no, that's true. that's true. And are you just... To clarify, are you thinking other domains, like other mathematical domains, or other domains besides math? Science. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and I. It's a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer for that, but I, I think it's true. And I, I mean, I do think. Um, in some sense, right, the examples that I've given are showing these kind of patterns that they could look back and extrapolate from. But we are, I think, also interested in situations where that's not the case, right? Where it's not just that you're extending or extrapolating from some pattern, but that actually maybe there's something more fundamentally structural that you're relating between. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I think it's a good question. Yeah. I just, I'm curious, did, did you ask them or do you get any sense of how they thought about the problem? So you, earlier in the talk, you kind of described how much was like finding this, this space of a set of options. Yeah. And I'd be curious if that it, like if that seems to be more central to the first student's approach, whereas 
like I can see my, if I had never done this kind of problem before, I might think, oh, okay, maybe counting is about finding a pattern in the numbers and extrapolating that out. And then when you realize that actually having this X, A, B notation was useful, then it was different enough to not compare. So yeah. here's a view. Do you get a sense of so, I mean, that's a great question, and I we never explicitly asked them that, but I would, um, I mean, I would infer that they did have just fundamentally different ways of viewing the activity that they were doing, right? And so, and some of that, I think, and we had other students too, so some aligned more like what Richie was doing, and some aligned more like what Tyler was doing, and I think, I think you're right that if you're viewing this counting problem. Like that, that notion of not thinking about or not viewing, you know, those numbers as actually representing the outcomes that you've listed, you know, that's that is not like that set-oriented perspective that I'm talking about, right? The counting to him wasn't about this relationship, but it was just about getting these numbers. So I, I think that's a good point. And even though we didn't explicitly ask them, I think we could infer that they had different ways of viewing those problems. So absolutely. And it, it raises an interesting question to me, like as I think about moving to the teaching experiments where we're trying to have students more productively generalize, like maybe asking that, you know, very explicitly up front and trying to have students think about counting as this problem solving activity and, and interest in outcomes is a good idea. So, yeah. yeah. But the tables that they had to fill out, they had two columns, and one of them was the number. So both of the columns basically focused on, like, you need to fill out the number. Like, you, right. you need to That's write. That's true, yes. They had, yes, yes. exactly. Because it seems to me that the structural similarity they should be looking for is in the listing, right? Mm hmm yeah, that's a really but something about the test design points to focus on number, mm -hmm. and so many mm -hmm. other math tests about, are about finding number mm -hmm. patterns. Yeah, that's I'm just curious to see whether yeah, yeah, yeah. how that may change. If the yeah, like if you made the table more as like list all of the outcomes. Yeah. Here, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And it's interesting. I mean, so one thing that we're trying to figure out now too, and I, so we have some extreme examples. So this is sort of a split between right something that's this numerical patterning versus maybe some arguing about structure outcomes. And it's kind of tough because on the one hand, like I don't want to just dismiss numerical as being, you know, never useful or unsophisticated because sometimes that's exactly what you need to do, right? Like you might not have any sense of what's going to work, but until you see the pattern. So for example, we have a nice case where this kid, you know, noticed the two, the doubling, and it wasn't until he could articulate and see that it was doubling that he then could go back and combinatorially explain why the doubling was happening, right? But if he hadn't had that numerical pattern, he wouldn't have ever even known that he needed to explain that. Um, and so I think a tension that I'm facing is, is yeah, how do you still in some sense like allow for explorations of something like a numerical pattern? And I'm thinking of this in terms of maybe like decontextualizing, right? So like for Richie maybe, or for some students, they just totally decontextualize, manipulate the numbers because that's easy, and especially for undergrads, like they have maybe this algebraic sense, they can do that. But then there's, they are not always able to then recontextualize back into, a, it's a problem about passwords or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I do think your point that, you know, the task inherently does focus on numbers is a good one. Yeah, it's something to think about. So, so yeah. in the framing of the talk, you told us that, and did we saw that, um, we'll see a case of two students who have different uh, meanings for the same representation. And yet, when you were looping back at the and conclusion implications, you didn't expand on that too much. Yeah. Is there something you you might uh, tell us, uh, some of you are also pre-service teachers, about this the very notion that two students are looking at the very same thing and they have you know, partial, partially overlapping, but not Yeah, yeah. Same. Well, and I think I mean, I think that, that your question about, you know, what are their views about counting even is, is related to that, right? That, and the, the, the meaning they might make of the same, right, externally similar structure of ones and x's that, that you could just be, be bringing to that same thing such a different view of, of what you're even trying to do, right, or, or what purpose that could even play. And so I do think, that, and that's why I'm mean, going to like this data is because 
when you first see it, I, I mean, I think I made the assumption, like, oh, Richie will use this just like Tyler did, because I can see how he can use it, right? He can, it relates so nicely, he could use it to solve more problems, and instead he just saw it in a totally different way than, than Tyler had. And so I think, and again, not to put Richie down, because his activity and the meanings that I think he made of the 11XX, which is, like, sure, he could view the X's as being A's or B's, but then he just treated them as new problems. Like, it totally aligns with the activity that he had been doing, because he didn't have this rich activity to sort of infuse into this representation he had come up with. You know, it, it's not often you see a talk where people are citing both uh, Charles Sanders Peirce and Jean Piaget, and, and I'm thinking that you might, in this case, make a bit more out of the Persian perspective. Uh, in the sense of uh, the meanings that people attribute to, to symbols or to perceptual displays. Yeah. Because for Peirce, he always spoke about a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. There's the, the symbol that has a certain meaning, mm -hmm. but it's always as mediated by the particular mm -hmm. person. There's these words I always confuse, representaman, and the, the mm -hmm. can't remember which is which. But within the meanings, it's like a mini. There's like another... Mm -hmm triangle inside there, what is that based on? And each one, it's like these triangles cascading all the way down. And I think it's, it's, a, it's nice to bring together the work of Piaget and Peirce and speak about how for two different students, those very, the very same kind of uh, objectively the same symbolic notation on paper ultimately did not cas cascade down all the way to the same thing, even though maybe one station down, but not two or three. Yeah. And that it's and it is grounded in a certain maybe sensory motor, mm -hmm. uh, in certain schemes. Yeah. 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 Any more questions, comments, and it's, uh, thank you again. Thank you.